أريح الهوى يا أم شمع ومشعلي على كل قبر دارس أو مجللي فلست براج قبر من كنت زائرا أقبر ولي كان أم قبر مرسلي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد تفضل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم الله تعالى وسلمنا والسامعين قال محمد رحمه الله قال قول الله تعالى يظنون بالله غير الحق أن الجاهلية يقولون هل لنا من الأمر من شيء قل إن الأمر كله لله الآية وقول الظالمين بالله بين السوء إن عليهم دائرة السوء عليهم دائرة السوء عليهم دائرة السوء الآية قال ابن قيم رحمه الله تعالى في الآية الأولى فسر هذا هذا الظن لأنه سبحانه لا سبحانه لا ينسو رسوله 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 وأن أمر أن أمره سيضمحله ففسر بأنهم أن ما أصاب أصابهم لم يكن بقدر الله وحكمة وحكمته ففسر بأن في إنكار الحكمة وإنكار القدر وإنكار أن يتم أمر أمر رسوله وأن يظهره يظهره على على الدين كله وهذا هو ظن السوء الذي ظنه المنافقون والمشركون في سورة الفتح وإنما كان هذا ظن السوء لأنه ظن غير ما يليق به به سبحانه وما يليق به بحكمته وحمده ووعده الصادق فمن ظن أنه يدير الباطل باطل على الحق على الحق إدالة مستقرة يتمحل معها الحق أو أنكر أن يكون ما جرى بقضائه وقدره أو أنكر أن يكون قدره لحكمة لحكمة بالغة يستحق عليها الحمد بل زعم أن أن ذلك لمشيئة لمشيئة مجردة فذلك ظن الذين كفروا فويل للذين كفروا من النار وأكثر الناس يظنون بالله ظن السوء في ما يختص بهم وفي وفي ما يفعله بغيرهم ولا ولا يسلم من ذلك إلا من عرف الله وأسماءه وصفاته وموجب وحكمته وحمده فليعتني اللبيب الناسق ناسق بنفسه بهذا وليقب إلى الله ويستغفره من ذنبه بربه ذن السوء ولو فتشت من فتشت لرأيت عند عنده تعنتا على القدر وملامة له وأنه كان ينبقي أن يكون كذا وكذا فمستقل فمستقل ومستكل ومستكثر وفتش نفسك على أن تسأل أن تسالم هل أنت سالم هل أنت سالم فإن تن تنجو منها تنجو من دي من دي عمت من دي عظيمة وإلا فإني لا إخالك نادي تناديا طيب chapter fifty nine باب قول الله تعالى يظنون بالله غير الحق ظن الجاهلية يقولون هل لنا من الأمر من شيء قل إن الأمر كله لله so this chapter is uh, pertaining to الظن الجاهلية what is known as الظن أو ظن الجاهلية having bad thoughts about Allah having evil thoughts about Allah Azza wa Jal uh, and having negative thoughts about Allah Azza wa Jal or questioning Allah's power um, questioning the Sharia uh, and similar to this so the maqsood of the tarjama and the objective of this tarjama is to clarify the hukum and the ruling with regards to dhannu al jahiliya with regards to dhannu al jahiliya what is the hukum and the ruling if a person has dhann or has evil thoughts and evil suspicions about Allah and his sharia Example, for example, if a person believes that falsehood 
and the batil will prevail over the haq and the truth. If a person believes this, this is dhannul jahiliya. Or for example, if a person questions Allah's power or says in their heart things like why isn't Allah uh, giving vic victory to his religion? The disbelievers are overpowering the Muslims. Why isn't Allah helping the believers? Or for example, dhannul jahiliya could be for example if a person believes or has an evil thought and says why do bad things happen to me? Why do bad things only happen to me? Why did it have to happen to me? Questioning the decree of Allah Azza wa Or is Islam suitable for the 21st century? Is Islam يعني, a person questioning, for example, the Sharia al Islamiya and saying things like we need to re evaluate some of the fatawa of the scholars, we need to rethink uh, some of the ahkam al Sharia. We need to rethink some of the uh, the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal, such as, for example, the cutting off of the hand of the thief, some matters pertaining to Al Qisas. These are barbaric, and <clears throat> we are in the 21st century, and we do not need to show this side of Islam, مثلا. Or, for example, is the hijab? A viable option nowadays for sisters for Muslim women should they really wear this hijab or even parts of the hijab yani even things that are Sunnah so, yani for example some scholars differ with regards to the niqab is the niqab wajib or obligatory or Sunnah there is a difference of opinion it doesn't matter which opinion you take but if someone for example even if you take the opinion that it's Sunnah if someone says the niqab isn't suitable for this day and age this falls into dhannul jahiliya. The hijab, you know, isn't suitable. It's not. It's not a practical option, for example. Um, or why doesn't Allah help the Muslims? And these are just sim these are just examples, my brothers. Just for so you understand the theme of the chapter. But there are. I'm sure you can think of other examples. So dhannul jahiliya. What exactly is dhannul jahiliya? Dhannul jahiliya is for the servant. To, to, to believe in their heart or to think in their heart that which is not befitting of Allah Azza wa Jal. That which is, isn't befitting of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you look at the Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala and what he says about Dhan al-Jahiliyyah, yani it's very clear what Ibn al-Qayyim is basically saying is that um, at the end he says وَلَوْ فَتَّشْتَ مَنْ فَتَّشْتَ لَرَأَيْتَ عِنْدَهُ تَعَنُّتًا عَلَى الْقَدْرِ وَمَلَامَةً لَهُ He says that if, if you really search deeply into, into each person, you'll notice that a lot of people, they have تَعَنُّتْ عَلَى الْقَدْرِ They have, they have تَسَخُّتْ عَلَى الْقَدْرِ يعني They have a grudge and, and uh, anger towards the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. When a person isn't content with their situation, مثلا, <coughs> you're not content with your financial situation, <clears throat> that doesn't mean you're not striving to better yourself that's a different issue but when a person isn't content he, they may have a roof over their head and they may be in a ni'mah and a blessing but they're not content they're always seeking more and they have this grudge against the qadr of Allah why didn't I why couldn't I be so, like so and so so and so drives this type of car why can't I drive like his car he's not better than me so this person has ta'annut ala al-qadr has a grudge against the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal, the, the decree of Allah in their heart. They may not say it with their tongues, but they have, they've fallen into dhannul jahiliya. They've fallen into madha? Dhannu al jahiliya. So as you can see, even the, even your thoughts should be, should conform to tawheed. Even the things that you think, and your, yani your belief and these thoughts that the shaitan whispers into our, our, our hearts, obviously we should repel them. If you don't repel them and you start to entertain them and start to believe in them, then it falls into dhannu al jahiliya. And dhannu al jahiliya, now that we know what it is, is something that contradicts tawheed. Dhannu al jahiliya goes against the essence of tawheed, either the asl of tawheed, the basic minimum required tawheed, or it goes against kamal al tawheed. The Kamal of Tawheed, the perfect Tawheed, the perfect Tawheed. 
So we understand from this that Dhanul Jahiliyyah is two types. The first type of Dhanul Jahiliyyah is for the person to think about Allah Azza wa Jal uh, and to have a dhan and a thought about Allah Azza wa Jal that isn't befitting of Allah, that is connected to Aslul Iman, that is connected to the, the minimum required Iman, such as if a person believes that and says Islam is unsuitable for this day and age, this dhan is kufr and disbelief and removes a person from the fold of Al-Islam. Or if a person be- thinks and says the reason why the Muslims are weak is because Allah is not capable of helping the Muslims. This is kufr and this is disbelief. This type of dhan is a dhan that removes the person from the fold of Al-Islam. Then you have the second type of dhan, which is for the person to think, uh, to have a thought about Allah Azza wa Jal that isn't befitting of Allah Azza wa Jal, that is connected to Kamalul Iman, that is connected to the perfect Iman. Such as, for example, if a person has this dhan and, and basically, for example, if a person has a thought that Allah is delaying the giving victory to his awliya, although they are deserving of his victory, but Allah is still delaying it for some reason. This is shirk asr. This is madha or kufr asr. This is madha kufr asr or minor kufr. Minor kufr. So this is a person who thinks, يعني, and has this thought that Allah is purposely delaying giving victory to his awliya and to the believers while he's able to do so but Allah is delaying it <clears throat> and they deserve to be Allah for Allah to give victory to them they've worshipped Allah, they've done everything that they're supposed to do but they haven't Is there a difference between uh, shirk, azhar and kufr? Or azhar? Sorry. shirk and kufr? Yeah. There is, every kufr yeah. is shirk Sorry, عفن, لا, the opposite. Okay. Every shirk is kufr. Every shirk is kufr, but not every kufr is shirk. Okay, so uh, ev- not every kufr is shirk. So, for example, there are some types of kufr, kufr like kufr al-ilhad, for example, like uh, denying the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal or Creator. That's kufr. That person hasn't fallen into, sh- they haven't associated any partners with Allah because they don't even believe in Allah. No. But they've fallen into kufr. And there's kufr al-juhud as well, kufr al-ta'til. There's six types of kufr that we'll learn, inshallah. In, kitab, in, in the book of Iman but for now every type of shirk falls into kufr is kufr but not every kufr is shirk now so um, so he, the author he mentions two evidences to support this chapter the first is ta'ala, so here this ayah and this verse indicates to the chapter from three different angles. The, the point of relevance is from three different angles. The first of these angles is that Allah Azza wa mentions here that their dhan is يَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ غَيْرَ الْحَقِّ He says that they, their thought about Allah is not the truth. So the fact that Allah says that their thought and their belief or their thought in Allah is not the truth, that means that it's dhan batil. فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ that means it's batil and false. The second is that Allah ascribes this dhan to jahiliyyah. And whatever is as, in the Quran and the Sunnah, if anything is ascribed to jahiliyyah, then what is it? Haram. It's haram. Number three, that this dhan here, who is Allah referring to in the dhamir? The pronoun refers to whom? The munafiqun. And if the munafiqun are... If, the, if Allah ascribes an action or a statement to the munafiqun or a thought to the munafiqun, then that means it's haram, obviously. So from these three angles, we know that dhanul jahili is impermissible. Dalil number two, Allah says, أَذَّانِّينَ بِاللَّهِ ظَنَّ السَّوْءُ عَلَيْهِمْ دَائِرَةُ السَّوْءُ So Allah Azza wa Jal here, the dilala and the point of relevance is that firstly, from three angles, firstly, Allah refers to their dhan of him that it is dhan as so it is an evil dhan it is a bad and evil dhan number two that Allah Azzawajal says alayhim da'irat as so that upon them is the punishment upon them is a punishment because of their dhan because of their dhan so this punishment is because of what? their evil dhan number three that this dhan is the dhan of the munafiqun and the mushrikun because Allah here is referring to the munafiqun and the mushrikun 
and the mushrikun and anything that's ascribed to the munafiqun and the mushrikun and the kuffar is haram or kufr or disbelief so whoever has an evil thought about Allah Azza wa in his legislative decree in his hukbullah his shar'i is similar to the one who has an evil thought about Allah in his universal decree the hukum of Allah is divided into two hukmullah al shar'i and hukmullah al qadari the hukum of Allah the legislative hukum of Allah and the universal hukum of Allah the qadr of Allah so having an evil thought about the sharia is similar to having an evil thought about the decree of Allah and the qadr of Allah so for example if a person says why is why why do bad things have to happen to me why does Allah have to decree these bad things happen to me why does why does it have this is this person is uh, is is basically uh, has a problem with which type of decree with which type of hukum Kauni, the hukum al kauni, the decree of Allah Azza wa But if a person says, Wallah, you know, nowadays Islam, uh, you know, people are going to the moon, and there's um, Islam is holding us back from going to the moon. This person has a problem with which, which type of hukum? The hukum al shari'i. The hukum al shari'i. The hukum al shari'i. Naam. So, um, this is something that we as students of knowledge need to be able to d- differentiate and distinguish from the statements of people you can tell which type of kufr or shirk they have fallen into and then if you know what the what the problem is yeah it's you know if you know what type of kufr and shirk they've fallen into then you can then uh, prescribe the correct medicine just like a tabib just like a doctor the doctor when you sit in front of a doctor the doctor needs to know what's wrong with you first before they prescribe any drug or any medicine they need to know what's wrong with you right then they can dis- prescribe the give you the correct medicine similarly the scholars the students of knowledge are the are the doctors of the heart and the, and they protect the people people's aqidah and they ensure with ilm and with knowledge that people remain upon ilm remain, remain upon tawhid and iman so if you know what the what the reason <coughs> and the type of kufr or, sh- or shirk uh, or the type of ma'asiyah the person is, is doing or saying or believing in then you can uh, you can challenge it accordingly with ilm and with hikmah or for example uh, what also falls into this is some people's belief that for example that uh, we need to go back and we need to reevaluate are the Yahud and the Nasara actually kuffar People, some people, there are actually some people who believe in this. Yani the Yehud and the Nasar are not kuffar. They believed in a book just like us. They, they had prophets sent to them just like us. And because of this, we can't call them kuffar. There are people who actually say this. So that is kufr, obviously. Man shakka fi kufr, yani you learn in Nawaqad al Islam, inshallah. Man shakka fi kufr al mushrikeen, fahuwa kafir. Whoever doubts the shirk and the kufr of the mushrikun then they also are disbelievers and this is bil ijma there is absolutely no disagreement in this in yani bain ahli al ilm there is no this is not a mas'ala khilafiyah sorry not a mas'ala ijtihadiyah okay this is not a mas'ala ijtihadiyah also um yani nowadays for example we have this uh, uh, movement the feminism feminism movement for example who want us to go back to the nusus and re-evaluate uh, issues pertaining to مثلا, shahadatul mar'a, the testimony of a woman you know why is the testimony of <coughs> two women equal to the testimony of one man you know and so they they say يعني, we need to re-evaluate these uh, masail and these these issues uh, and sim- you know things similar to for example يعني, the polygamy for example uh, يعني, the, the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal has allowed a man to marry more than one wife فَنْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَا وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَاعَ يعني, These type of nusus, we need to go back We need to re-evaluate them Ayat of, of Jihad, for example Surah Al-Tawbah, Surah Al-Anfal These two surahs are causing many problems for us Some people are, يعني, some of these shayateen They're even t- saying we need to remove these surahs from the Mus'haf Surah Tawbah, it's all about fighting. 
قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ يَلُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْكُفَارِ وَلْيَجِدُوا فِيكُمْ غِلْضَ we, need, we, don't, we cannot recite these type of verses anymore. These are all things that fall into this chapter heading. So as you can see, my brothers, Kitab al-Tawheed encompasses everything in, to do with Tawheed and Shirk. These mutun are relevant. They're relevant. They, they were relevant 100 years ago. They will be relevant in 100 years' time. In 100 years' time, someone will be teaching Kitab al-Tawheed and will be coming across statements and beliefs that we at the moment do not know. But the response to those statements is in the mutun, is in the Quran and the Sunnah. So it's you, so every challenge that life or يعني, that is thrown at us, we will always find the answer in the Kitab and the Sunnah. But we can't obviously, we don't have the knowledge and the ahliya to actually open the mushaf like the sahaba and the tabi'un, the scholars and the ahadith and find the answers there and then we need these mutun ilmiya we need these mutun ilmiya to show us the way now chapter 50 uh, chapter 60 <laughs> قال ابن عمر رضي الله رضي الله عنهما والذي نفس نفس ابن عمر ربها بيده لو كان لاحدهم مثل اخرج ذهبا ثم انفقه في سبيل الله ما قبله الله منه حتى يؤمن بالقدر حتى يؤمن بالقدر حتى يؤمن بالقدر ثم استدل بقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الايمان ان تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الاخر وتؤمن بقدر خيره وشره رواه مسلم وعن عن عباده بن ثابت رضي الله عنه انه قال لابنه يا بني انك لن تجد طعم الايمان حتى تعلم ان ما اصابك لم يكن ليخطئك وما اخطاك لم يكن ليصيبك سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إن أول ما خلق الله القلم فقال له اكتب فقال ربي فماذا فماذا أكتب قال اكتب مقادير مقادير كل شيء حتى تقوم الساعة يا بني يا بني سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من مات على قيل هذا فليس مني وفي وفي رواية لأحمد إن أول ما خلق الله القلم ثم قال اكتب فجرى في في تلك الساعة بما هو كائن إلى يوم القيامة وفي رواية لابن وهب قال رسول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فمن لم يؤمن يؤمن بالقدر خيره وشره أحرقه الله في النار وفي المسند والسنن عن ابن عن ابن الدليل عن ابن قال اتيت ابي ابي بن كعب رضي الله عنه وقلت في نفسي في نفسي شيء من القدر فحدثني بشيء لعل الله يذهب يذهبه من قلبي من قلبي فقال لو انفقت لو انفقت مثل احد ذهبا ما قبله الله منك حتى تؤمن بالقدر تعلم أن ما أصابك لم يكن يخطئك وما أخطأك لم يكن يصيبك ولو مت على غير هذا لكنت من أهل النار قال فأتيت عبد الله بن مسعود عبد الله بن مسعود وحديثة بن وحديثة بن اليمان وزيد بن ثابت رضي الله عنهم وكلهم حدثني بمثل ذلك من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حديث صحيح رواه حاكم في صحيح نعم Bab Majah Afi Munkiri Al Qadr, Chapter 60. Chapter pertaining to Munkiri Al Qadr, those who deny the Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Those who matha, who deny the decree, reject the Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the objective of this chapter is to teach you and to clarify for you the hukum and the ruling on Munkiri Al Qadr those who reject the Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. So what exactly is the Qadr? The Qadr or al qadr or al qadr Afwan uh, legislatively and Shar'an is, this is the definition, is Allah's Ilmullahi bil Kainat. Ilmullahi bil Kainat wa kitabatuha wa mashi'atuhu wa khalquhu iyaha. 
it is ilmullah bil kainat it is allah's eternal eternal knowledge of all events all events wa kitabatuha and his recording of these events wa mashiatuhu and allah's will and allah's will wa khalquhu iyaha and allah's creation of these events allah's willing of these events and his creation of these events so with that a definition you you learn that the qadr is four has four pillars the qadr according to ahl sunnah wal jamaah has four pillars what's the first pillar knowledge ilmullah the knowledge of allah azza wa jal what's the second pillar recording kitaba what's the third pillar the mashia the will of allah and finally number four what's the fourth pillar his creation allah's creation khalq these are the four pillars of al qadr and uh, in usul al sunnah we will learn each pillar in more detail the adilla and the evidence is for each pillar and what actually each pillar entails what it means so the author rahimahullah ta'ala here he's he mentions four evidences four evidences to support this chapter the first is the hadith of abdullah ibn umar abdullah ibn umar was in on in hajj while he was in hajj two of the tabi'un uh, they came to him and asked and told him about a uh, a phenomenon that appeared in the muslim lands a group that suddenly appeared in the muslim lands then who believe that an al amra unuf they believe that there is no qadr allah does not decree anything and that everything that happens all of the kainat are things that happen at that precise precise moment and allah is not aware what yani allah doesn't know what's going to happen next so the, they were called the Qadariyah. They were called the Qadariyah and in Usul al-Sunnah, inshallah, we will delve deeper into them and who they are. So Abdullah ibn Umar responded to them by saying what he says here. وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ بْنِ عُمَرَ بِيَدِهِ لَوْ كَانَ لِأَحَدِهِمْ مِثْلُ أُحُدٍ ذَهَبًا ثُمَّ أَنْفَقَهُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ مَا قَبِلَهُ اللَّهُ مِنْهُ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ So the wajhu al-dilal and the point of reference is that uh, Abdullah ibn Umar made takfir of them that he removed them from the fold of Islam here that Allah will not accept their sadaqah will not accept their righteous deeds why? until they believe in the qadr which means that believing in the qadr is a pillar from the pillars of iman and Abdullah ibn Umar he made takfir of them um, also Abdullah ibn Umar says that Allah will not accept anything from them until they believe in the qadr and Allah does not accept from the kafir but he accepts from the believers so that means that they were disbelievers as for the second delil as for the second delil so there's four evidences he mentions the hadith of ubad ibn samit that he said to his son ya bunayya innaka lan tajida ta'am al-iman the hadith in sunan abi dawood and jami' at-tirmidhi and the dilal and the point of relevance of this hadith is uh, where ubad ibn samit says مَنْ مَاتَ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِ هَذَا فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي نعم يعني عفوا the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says at the end of the hadith whoever dies upon this is not from me whoever dies upon this is not from me okay so that means that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم absolved himself from these people and finally, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says in the, th- the other version and the un- other narration that Allah will burn them in the fire. Allah will burn them in the fire in the adab. And uh, when whenever you see in the Quran and the Sunnah that Allah will burn a people in the fire ihraq, then that means they are disbelievers. They are kuffar. They are not Muslims. But Allah Azzawajal punishes the, and if you see Allah will punish these people, then they could be Muslims. But if it's burning, ihraq, then they are disbelievers. 
uh, and also also from the, uh, uh, the another another point of relevance is where he says in the that you will not find this or taste the sweetness of iman until you believe يعني, in the qadr until you believe in the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Before we move on to the next Dalil, here the Prophet says, Inna awwala ma khalaqallahu al-qalam. What does that bit mean? Just that bit. What does it mean? The first thing which Allah created was the pen. Sorry? The first thing which Allah created is the pen. The first thing that which Allah created is the pen. Anyone has another is that correct? Do you all agree with that? I think there's one moderation that says but no, forget that narration. I'm talking about this one. What does this one mean? In the We have what we have the brother saying that the first thing that Allah created is the pen. Is that the translation you have in front of you by any chance? Yeah. Sorry? Yes. That's the wrong translation. That's the wrong translation. The correct translation here is when Allah Azzawajal first created the pen. What's the difference between the two? If I say to you, the first thing that Allah created was the pen, or when Allah first created the pen, what's the difference? Big difference, Big difference right? <laughs> Huge difference. So here, in the awwal ma khalaq Allah al when Allah first created the pen, He said this. There's another narration where where Allah Azza where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Kan Allah." وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ قَبْلَهُ There was for Allah and there was nothing before Allah. وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَى الْمَاءِ And Allah's arsh and his throne was upon water. So there was nothing but Allah and his throne existed. So that means that the throne was created before or after the pen? Before the pen. So there's no contradiction. The people who say there's a contradiction between the, the narration that I mentioned about the arsh and this hadith that's in front of us, is because they don't understand the Arabic language. Okay? In ma khalaq Allah al If I say to you now, ma tadkhul al fasl, aw al ma tadkhul al masjid, ijlis, aw afun salli. When you first enter the masjid, pray. Aw in awwala ma dakhal al talibu al fasl, kataba ismahu, ala al sabbura. When the student first entered the classroom, he wrote his name on the board. Okay? So there's a big difference. In the awwala, there's a big difference. Okay? So that's something I just wanted to clarify, inshallah. Dalil number three is the hadith of Ubad al Nasamit, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, alladhi inda ibn Wahab, fa innahu, naam. This hadith, hadith Abdullah ibn Nasamit, um, the wajhud dilala is similar to the previous one, it's similar to Dalil number two. Because it talks about the Prophet Sallallahu says that whoever doesn't believe in the Qadr, Allah will burn him in the fire. That means that person is a kafir because of, the, because of ihraq. So this principle that you're learning now, ahraqahu Allahu, is, is used for whom? For the kafir, not for the Muslim. Okay, because here, if this person doesn't believe in the Qadr, they are no longer Muslims. Dalil number four is the, is the hadith of Ibn Samit. Also, uh, عفن, Dalil number four, is uh, the hadith of Ibn Daylami, the isnad is Hassan, and the wajhud dilala is the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi nar. If you died upon this, you would have been from the people of the fire. That's the wajhu ad dilala. Now, so my brothers, look at the benefit of this. يعني, what we learn from this mas'al, يعني, uh, from this chapter. So what we learn from this chapter, is that inkar al-qadr is kufr, rejecting the qadr. That's literally the sentence. The whole chapter, what you learn from it, is that inkar al-qadr, disbelieving in the decree, the divine decree of Allah Azza wa Jal, or any of those four pillars, is considered to be uh, kufr. Um, and it's important for, for the Muslim to believe that the answer to everything it lies in the Quran and the Sunnah. The answer to every riddle, the answer to every problem, the answer to every social illness is Alhamdulillah in the Quran and the Sunnah. I'm going to read to you for you an Athar. Uh, an Athar uh, uh, in uh, yani there was the, an Athar basically that was narrated by Ibn Sa'ad 
that a man came to Hudayf ibn al-Yaman and Abu Mas'ud al-Ansari. Those two companions of the Prophet sallallahu So a man came to them and they were sitting in the masjid. Who was sitting in the masjid? Hudayfa and Abu Mas'ud al-Ansari. They were two companions. So this man saw them sitting in the masjid and he said to them, Antuma qa'idani huna waqad kharaj al-nas. Why are, you all, why are you both sitting here and the people are going out, I have revolted and they're fighting? Me, يعني, why are you in the masjid when people have left and are revolting? Similar to someone comes to you now and says, why are you in the masjid? Why are you not protesting for the rights of the Muslims? Literally, word for word. How many times do you hear this? Why are you in the masjid? Why are you learning, يعني, you're just sitting in the masjid? Why are you not going to revolt against the rulers? That's what they were saying. Why are you not demonstrating and protesting for the rights of Palestine, the, the Yehuda bombing Gaza? And the, يعني, you're sitting here in the masjid reading Kitab al Tawheed. You should be out there, you should be in front of 10 Downing Street with, with the flag of Palestine on your shoulders. That's what you should be doing. So they were saying to these two companions, Why are you sitting in the masjid? Then, he then said, Wallahi, inna ala sunnah. By Allah, we are upon the sunnah. He's saying to this to whom? Two companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at what jahl does to you. Ignorance. Similar to some of these shabab nowadays, these youth that have this youth, youthful, what do they call it? Yani, uh, yani youthful energy or whatever. And they go to the ulama and the scholars and they accuse the scholars of not caring about the Ummah and just teaching books. That's all these scholars do. Some of them have even labeled the scholars as ulama al hayd wa nifas the scholars of menstruation and postnatal bleeding, the scholars of hayd wa nifas not knowing. Al-Imam subhanAllah and Nawawi, many of the scholars have said that the issues pertaining to hayd are the most difficult issues. Wallahi, it would be an honor for me to be a alim of Hayd, <laughs> Sarahatan. What an honor to be a alim in, in issues to be pertaining to Hayd and Nifas. Who can say that? I can't say it, certainly. So, this is what they, they belittle the scholars because of this. So, Alayitihal, to go back to the Athar, he said, By Allah, we are upon the Sunnah. And Hudayfa, he said to him, Lestum ala Sunnah, Hatta yushfiq al ra'i wa tansah al ra'iyah. You are not upon the sunnah until you obey the rulers. And you, are, you have advice, you have sincere advice in your heart and sincerity towards whom? Towards the people. Who's saying this? Hudayfa. The Khawarij of today, they would probably accuse Hudayfa and Abu Mas'ud al-Ansari as ulama al hayd wa nifas or ulama al salatin the scholars of the scholars for dollars. They would accuse the, the, these Sahabi. Yani these sahabi, Sahaba were specifically sitting in the masjid and a jahil came to them, said, why are you sitting in the masjid and not revolting and rebelling and demonstrating and protesting, waving flags around like a yani, ahmaq, or going to pro protests and demonstrations and yani, where there are mix, there's, you know, men and women are mixing and laughing together. And يعني, with anashid as well. Can you imagine? يعني, look at the humq of the Muslims, subhanAllah, some of these masakeen. Going to demonstrations and, and, and shouting uh, meaningless slogans, subhanAllah, thinking that they are upon the haqq, thinking that that's the way to rectify the ummah. Min jahlihim, subhanAllah. Hudayfa said to him, Wallahi, you are not upon the sunnah. And then the man responded and he said, فَقَالَ لَهُ الرَّجُلُ What if we don't obey the rulers? What, what about them? Hudayfa said, إِذَنْ نَخْرُجْ وَلَا نُسَاكِنُكُمْ Hudayfa said, we will, we will abandon you and we will not live with you. يعني, you are not from us and you are, we are not from you. انظر إلى هذا. This Sahabi, look at his response to this Khariji to this basically uh, this person so we learned from this my brothers that anyone who incites hatred against the rulers rebels against the rulers even if they don't make takfir of them is a khariji 
full stop. Anyone who rebels, incites hatred against the Muslim rulers, goes on the member, or starts to, to, to insult the rulers, this person is not from uh, is not from Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. This person is a Khariji, even if they have the Mus'haf in their right hand and Sahih Bukhari in their left. It doesn't matter. This is something, this is one of the principles of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah, and there is no Ijma' my brothers. There, sorry, there is no Khilaf. There is Ijma', but there is no, uh, Alhamdulillah, Khilaf. نعم تفضل <تصفيق> قال أخرجا ولهما عن عائشة رضي الله عنها أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أشد الناس عذابا يوم القيامة الذين يضاعفون بخلق الله ولهما عن ابن وعلهما عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول كل مصور في النار يجعل يجعل له بكل سورة صورها يجعل له يجعل له بكل سورة بكل سورة صورها نفس يعذب بها في في جهنم ولهما عنه رضي الله عنه مرفوعا من صور سورة في الدنيا خلف أن ين أن ينفق فيها الروح وليس بنافق وليس بنافق والمسلم أن أبي أن أنا بحياج قال قال لي علي رضي الله عنه ألا أبعث ألا أبعثك على ما بعثني عليه الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ألا تدع سورة إلا تمستها ولا قبرا مشرفا إلا سويته سويته Chapter 61, Bab Maja fil Musawwireen. So, chapter with regards to the hukum and the ruling of the Musawwirun, the picture makers. The Musawwirun are those people who make pictures um, or take pictures. So, what is the hukum of them? And uh, he, he uh, so he basically mentions five evidences. The first is the hadith of Abu Hurairah. قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى So this is a hadith Qudsi وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ ذَهَبَ يَخْلُقُ كَخَلْقِ And the point of relevance is firstly that Allah says وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ Who is more oppressive? Who is more of a sinner? Then the person مِمَّنْ ذَهَبَ يَخْلُقُ كَخَلْقِ The one who who created something similar to my creation. Obviously, he didn't create anything, but he tried to create something. So this person is the most oppressive of people. Also, the second point of relevance is at the end of the hadith, where Allah Azza wa challenges this person and says, فَلْيَخْلُقُوا ذَرَّ Let him try to create an atom. Let him try to create a habba, a grain. Let him try to create a sha'ira, a corn of barley. Let him do that. Of course he can't. So Allah is challenging this person. So that means that this person has fallen into something that is haram. And making pictures is kufr. Making pictures can be kufr asghar. Okay, can be kufr asghar. Um, and it can be kufr akbar. So generally speaking, it's kufr because if that person, uh, while making the picture, they are trying to make themselves or that they, they believe or they're basically trying to, ch- to, to make something similar to Allah Azza wa Jal. Something similar or try to, to design a creation by making a picture of it uh, tr- to try to challenge the creator. To try to challenge the creator, so matter it becomes it becomes uh, kufr. Otherwise, it becomes haram and it's impermissible. The number two is the hadith of Aisha. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ashad al nasi adab al yom al qiyamah." And the 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 people that will be will be punished the most severe uh, on yom al qiyamah are al musawwirun, the picture makers, those who make pictures, those who make pictures. 
and uh, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this second hadith. Uh, he said, uh, يعني He mentioned the illa and the reason for this. يعني they are those who make the something similar to Allah's creation. يعني They're trying to make something similar to Allah's creation. To Allah's creation. Um, so that basically tells us that this is something that is haram. Dalil number three is the hadith of Ibn Abbas. Uh, he, that the Prophet said Kullu musawwirin fidnar Every picture maker is in the fire Subhanallah Every picture maker is in the fire And the wajhu dilala is clear Every picture maker is in the fire Okay And Allah, the Prophet says Yuj'allahu bi kulli suratin sawwaraha Nafsun yu'adhabu biha fi jahannam يعني Every uh, picture or every soul um, يعني Yuj'allahu uh, surah, يعني basically a soul will be uh, breathed uh, into every picture that they prepare um, and that, that, that picture will punish him in Jahannam so the pictures that they've made are going to be a source of punishment for them on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and that's the Wajhu Dilala Dalil number 4 is the Hadith of Ibn Abbas Hadith of Ibn Abbas similar to Dalil number 3 uh, يعني القيامة, they will be told these are the pictures that you've made go and uh, breathe life into them breathe life into them of course they won't be able to do so that would be so that would be a form of punishment for them the lead number five is the hadith of Abil Hayyaj al-Asadi where Ali ibn Abi Talib he sent him on a mission and he said, Ala abaathuka ala ma baathani alayhi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Should I not send you on the, on the same mission that the Prophet sallallahu sent me upon? And the dilala is where he says, An la tada'a suratan illa tamastaha. That you don't come across a picture except that you will, you will wipe the picture. You will destroy the picture. Naam. All of these evidences and these ahadith, they tell us of hurmatu taswir. The the, hara, the the this the impermissibility of taking pictures the impermissibility of taking pictures so if a person who's taking pictures so the person sorry taking pictures has two situations the first situation is a kufr disbelief and that's when their the intention in making those pictures is to challenge Allah Azza wa Jal is to challenge Rabbul Alameen the Creator then it becomes kufr it becomes the second situation is that it becomes fisq and it, it becomes a, a, a sin if that's not the intention and they just basically just make a picture for the sake of making a picture then it becomes kabair al not sagira my brothers it's a major sin it becomes a kabira and it is a major sin now and these hadith my brothers are general they're amma these hadith they talk about they don't they don't specify drawing with your hand or taking a picture with an instrument like a phone it's am kullu musawwir fil kullu musawwir so these ahadith encompass taking a picture with your phone or drawing with your hands and they encompass taking a picture with a camera also musawwir so that's why my brothers we should really abstain from it except if there is a darura and there is a necessity to take a picture and for example if you take a, 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 mug sh- a picture of your head for example your face for your passport or identity pic- pictures f- for your identity in order you know you have identity papers where you have to have your picture on them this is darura this is darura or for example if it's a haja and there's a need that's basically for example pictures in order to place on your shahada certificates and the like Okay, as for what's going on nowadays, where subhanAllah people are taking pictures of each other just for the fun of it, and yeah, there's people who take selfies of each other 100 times a day, subhanAllah. Are they not tired of looking at themselves, yeah, and subhanAllah, taking pictures of, of themselves hundreds of times a day, every single time they are falling into a major sin. Kabira min kabair al dhunub. A'udhu billah, subhanAllah. You have social media filled with pictures. You have even some students of knowledge taking selfies and, and posing for cameras. يعني. 
subhanallah la yaliq hadha that's not something that subhanallah is befitting of a muslim and to take pictures like this to resist the urge in family if you're in family events and they're taking pictures tell them i don't want to be in the picture simple don't put me in in, the, in that picture you know some people say what about if i take pictures lidhikriyat lidhikriyat you know just to remember occasions just to remember the situation still haram it's still impermissible you know you don't need to remember you need, you know you remember occasions but to take a picture is still me that doesn't justify taking pictures نعم اخي delete them yeah just simple delete them عفى الله ان شاء الله عما سلف ومن عاد ايش فينتقم الله منه Allah Azza wa Jalla, inshallah, will forgive us for what we have done previously. Inshallah ta'ala, we seek, we seek, we repent to Allah. Nastaghfirullah wa natubu ilayhi. Okay? We, we delete these pictures and we don't do it again. And even worse, the hadith doesn't even talk, talk about placing pictures in the home. Some people, they decorate their house with pictures. The malaika, the angels, don't enter a house where there is a picture. If the malaika don't enter a house where there is a picture, who enters that house? The shaitan. And then these people complain about jinn and sihr. And they complain about problems in the home, mashakil, in the, ho- in the house. Why? Because there's no angels coming into your house. Iblis is dining on your, is having dinner on your table. And his offspring are sitting on your couches and, and, and watching TV with you and laugh and sitting there, subhanAllah. Of course, what do you expect? You expect khair and barakah in your house? Wallah, there will be no khair and barakah until you remove those pictures. It is, يعني, this, is, as, يعني, this is the problem. With, a lot of Muslims have become so westernized يعني, that they, uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said بالقدّة بالقدّة You will follow the, the sunnah and the path of those who preceded you Until that when they, if, they fall, if they go into a, a hole of a lizard You will follow them in that hole You will follow them in it This is the situation we are in as Muslims So this chapter as you can see Affects taking pictures Affects tawheed Taking pictures affects your tawheed it can affect Aslu Tawheed and it can affect Kamalu uh, Tawheed. So, what if, for example, some people now they say, but by denying pictures and by stopping us from taking photographs and taking pictures, you're essentially what you're doing is that uh, you're, uh, you're, 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 you're denying uh, art, and art is beauty. <laughs> We want to be artists. Everyone now wants to be an artist. We want to be artists and art is beauty. The response to that is that whatever Allah Azza wa Jal says is beautiful, we believe is beautiful. Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. Sah? Whatever Allah and His Sharia have made halal for us, we know it's beautiful. If it is haram, then it is not beautiful. Qat'an, it's not beautiful. If it's haram, it's not beautiful. And you know the saying now, you know, people, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah, and this is a saying, yeah, and it, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But in Islam, beauty is dependent upon the sharia. Whatever the sharia tells us is beautiful, we regard it as beautiful. Whatever is halal is beautiful. Whatever is haram is not beautiful. So, naqif in the nas. Yani, we stand upon the nas. Sufyan al-Thawri, he used to say, إِنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ أَنْ لَا تَحُكَّ رَأْسَكَ إِلَّا بِأَثَرْ فَافْعَلْ Sufyan al-Thawri, he said, if you can, if you can, if you can uh, stop yourself from scratching your head, except with a dalil, then do so. That's the extent, يعني, of, of the salaf. يعني, even scratching your head, look for a dalil if you can, before scratching your head. So my brothers, this is very important, inshallah ta'ala. These, these principles and these qawa'id have to be ingrained in our hearts. We have to, when we go to sleep and we, when we wake up, we have to have these principles always in front of us because we don't know what shubha 
we are going to hear tomorrow. Shubuhat come to you in your phone. In your phone, you don't even need to uh, watch television anymore. These shubhat, subhanallah, are everywhere. You don't know which shubha is going to you're going to read next or hear next. Unsolicited shubhat come to your ears and eyes. So the only way to to protect yourself is and to hasin nafsaka bil ilm that you protect yourself with knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the more protection you have. If you don't have knowledge, then you will fall prey to all of these shubhat and you will start to accept the statements of these people. Al Imam al Awza'i, what did he say? Iyaka wa ara'a al Rijal wa in zakhrafuhu laka bil qaw, alayka bil athar. Wa iyaka wa ara'a al Rijal wa in zakhrafuhu laka bil qaw. I warn you regarding the opinions of men, even if they beautify it for you. Even if they beautify their opinions for you, people will justify their opinions. They will come to you. The shaitan said, the, the shaitan said, I will come to them from, from in front of them. I will come to them from behind them. I will come to them from their right. I will come to them from their left. And you will not find many of them grateful to you. So the shubahat will come from every angle. The shaitan will use every single and utilize every tool at his disposal to make sure that you end up in Jahannam. That's his hadith. So the only way to protect yourself is through Al-Mutun al ilmiya There literally is no other way. I have seen people going to lectures for years and ended up uh, ended up uh, uh, ended up stopping to practicing my brothers I have even seen some of these people in Medina some people some of them have even well, billah, may Allah keep us firm have apostated I have I have known people who are upon Islam upon Tawheed upon La ilaha illallah but they left the fold of Islam altogether يعني, خلاص, they not they, they actually ascribe themselves to another religion. We're not talking about a person, for example, who stopped praying. We're talking about a person who openly says, I'm not a Muslim anymore. I don't believe in Islam anymore. And they basically were people who could speak Arabic as well. But what was the difference between them and those who didn't apostate is because these, pe- these people lacked knowledge of Aqeedah and Tawheed and never ever studied Al-Mutun al ilmi and that's one of the main reasons why they left the fold of Al-Islam. Now. Uh, were they, did they graduate and then left? No, no, before. No, before. No. Some people, the pictures they take, the eyes out, for example. Now, so the pictures, there's an Athar by Abdullah ibn Abbas where he says that that uh, he says that the that, that that you should remove the eyes. You should remove uh, Ibn Abbas. He said, I think I wrote it somewhere. He said, in the Masura to Arras, Ibn Abbas said that the Surah, the picture that you're not allowed to 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 create, is. The, the, the head, the head. Um, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, um, he mentioned, there's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that, the, that uh, you're allowed to, uh, to take, to make pictures of inanimate objects like trees and rocks and mountains, etc. But not anything that has a soul and a ruh. And you have to remove the eyes or the head. Okay, that's, you have to remove the eyes or the head. Now. So kids, instead of drawing, then we teach them calligraphy. We teach them ilm al khat, how to write calligraphy. Calligraphy is beauty. You know that's that's something that you can you can teach them. So instead of teaching them to draw, teach them calligraphy. They don't need to draw, my brothers. Let's and don't let's not get brainwashed by what the West, by the standards of the West when it comes to teaching. They've they have basically convinced the whole world that kids have to draw in order to learn. <laughs> what happened to all of the kids you know, that lived hundreds of years ago? Yani? They, did they not learn anything? They don't need to learn, they don't need to le- draw. Don't teach your kids to draw. In fact, if you see them drawing, break the pen. Tell them, don't draw. Punish them if they draw. Don't. 
It's يعني, you're only opening the doors of the shaitan, taking pictures as well. This is not something that we should encourage our children as well to do. يعني, taking pictures, taking selfies. These are things that subhanallah that you know that are not befitting of a Muslim. It's a kabira min kabair al that's a t- different topic. T- t- يعني, taking videos and cameras. Some ulama say that it does fall into this. Some ulama still consider taking videos and cameras as impermissible. Uh, ca- or taking videos and it falls into this. And other ulama, they say no, it doesn't fall into because it's a moving picture. So there is a khilaf in the masala. Naam. Like I said, you're allowed. That's fine. Naam. Naam. Chapter 63. <coughs> 62, sorry. <laughs> فلا يزكيهم فلهم عذاب عليم وشيمت زال وعائل مستكبر ورجل جعل الله بطاعته لا يشتري لا يشتري إلا باليمين باليمينه ولا ولا يبيع إلا بيمينه رواه الطبراني بسند سفيه وفي السفيه عن عمران بن حسين رضي الله عنهما قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خير أمتي قرن ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم قال عمران فلا أدري أذكر بعد قرني قرني مرتين أو أو ثلاثة ثم إن بعدهم قوما يشهدون ولا ولا يستشهدون ويقولون ويقولون ولا ولا يؤتمنون وينظرون ولا يوفون ويذهب فيهم السمن وفيه عن ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال خير الناس قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم ثم يجيء يوم ثم يجيء قوم تسلق شهادة أحدكم يمينه ويمينه شهادته قال إبراهيم كانوا يذربوننا على الشهادة والأحد ونحن سقار yeah. So chapter 62, Bab Maja fi Kathratil Halaf. Frequently taking oaths or excessively taking oaths. And the objective of this chapter is to give you the hukum and to clarify the hukum of Kathratul Halif. What is the hukum of excessively taking oaths? So he mentions six evidences. Qawluhu ta'ala wahfadhu aymanakum. Allah Azza wa says, Wahfadhu, preserve and protect your oath. So hifdhul yameen, protecting your oath is um, not being excessive in taking oaths, not being excessive li- taking oaths. And saying Wallahi all the time, by Allah all the time, this is not something that is uh, allowed. Um, and the second delay is the hadith of Abu Hurairah, Samit Rasul Al-Halifu Man Faqatun Li Sil'a. So the Prophet here says that oath taking uh, causes uh, your sil'a, your, your merchandise or your, or your commodity to sell. Yani when you're selling a commodity, the tujar, they say, by Wallahi, I bought this for 20 pounds and I'm selling it to you by Allah, I'm just selling it to you for 18 pounds. So they, they all, yani, tujar, they constantly take oaths. So the Prophet is saying that, you know, these oaths that you're taking may cause your commodity to sell, but then the Prophet said, but it deprives it of blessing. It deprives it of blessing because you had to use the name of Allah for something so insignificant. So that's basically how it affects Tawheed. You're using something so insignificant. You're using the name of Allah for something so insignificant. The name of Allah should be used for things that are worthy of things that are worthy. So things that are significant, not taking, buying, and selling. That's a dunyawi thing. Um, so that's basically the wajhud dilal for delil number two. Delil number three is the hadith of Salman al-Farisi, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that three people, la uh, Allah will never speak to them. And the wajhud dilal is at the end, Allah, the Prophet says, وَرَجُلٌ جَعَلَ اللَّهَ بِضَاعَتَهُ يعني a man who made Allah his merchandise. لا يشتري إلا بيمينه. This person doesn't buy except by taking an oath. 
And they don't sell except without taking an oath. So they made Allah into some sort of commodity or product. The name of Allah has become a product. Every product that they sell, they have to attach the name of Allah with it. So the name of Allah has lost its meaning to these people. So that's where basically the naqs of Tawheed comes in, the deficiency of Tawheed. Yani if I want to sell this, I say, Wallahi, this is a good uh, يعني, يعني this is a good uh, natural mineral water. So every time I sell it, if I want to buy something, I say, say Allah, say by Allah, that's what, you know, this sil'a is worthy, or this sil'a, or this commodity or product is not uh, deficient, or is not broken, or this car is unbroken. Say, Wallah, يعني, so the name of Allah has lost its meaning. So that's basically the word of Dilala. The lead number uh, four is the hadith of Imran and Hussein and the Dilala is at the end of the hadith uh, the Prophet وسلم, the, Pro- the Dilala is firstly the Prophet وسلم, he praised uh, the three first three generations so here the Prophet praised the first three generations and one of the reasons why the Prophet praised them وسلم, is that they weren't excessive in taking oaths the first three generations were known for not being excessive when it comes to taking oaths number two uh, the Prophet saying وَيَنْذُرُونَ وَلَا يُوفُونَ وَيَنْذُرُونَ يعني The Prophet describing the people that come after the first three generations There will be people who take vows And taking a vow here encompasses taking an oath So another, remember we co- another the, mean, the general meaning of another was the whole of Islam So these people t- took a vow to, uh, to, to, to imp- implement and apply Islam upon themselves and they did not fulfill that vow. Similarly, they take oaths and they say, By Allah, sanaf'alu wa sanaf'alu. We will do this and we will do that. But then they don't, they don't uh, fulfill their promise. They don't fulfill the covenant and their promise. So that basically, they break their oath. So that if they break their oath that they've taken by Allah, that means these, these people, the name of Allah doesn't really mean anything to them. The lead number five is the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud. Messenger Sallallahu said خير الناس قرني and the Dilala is at the end of the hadith ثم يجيء قوم تسبق شهادة أحدهم يمينه ويمينه شهادته يعني there will be a people uh, who يعني their testimony will precede their oath their shahada is going to come before their oath and sometimes even their oaths will precede their shahada what does that mean? that means that these people Sometimes, when, when, when they are required to take an oath, they don't take an oath. When they don't have to take an oath, they take an oath. Okay, so sometimes their oaths will precede their testimony. Their oaths, they will say, Wallahi, he did this. Wallahi, he didn't do this. And then people say, are you, are you prepared to testify? They say yes. So they should have waited. Before saying Wallahi, they should have waited for the testimony. So these people don't actually understand the... The, 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 and have no respect for the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Dari number six is the statement of Ibrahim al Nakhai, Kanu Yadribunana ala Shahada to Al Ahd, Wanahno Sigari. And Ibrahim al Nakhai, he says that his teachers, يعني, his teachers were the Sahaba, they used to beat us when we took oaths for no reason. So as children, they used to get beaten for saying, Wallahi, يعني, just taking oaths. Or for breaking their promises, for breaking their promises. So as children, look, subhanAllah, they're children and they are, subhanAllah, the elders are, if a child makes a promise, they, يعني, they would beat them if they didn't fulfill that promise, يعني, subhanAllah. Um, so, chapter 63. <laughs> ولا تنقض الأيمة إيمانا بعد توحيدها الآية أن أنعم ريضة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا أمر أميرا على على جيش أو أو سرية أو ساه بتقوى الله فمن معه من المسلمين خيرا ثم قال أخذوا بسم الله في سبيل الله قاتلوا من كفر بالله أخذوا ولا ولا تقول ولا تقول ولا تقول ولا تغضبوا ولا ولا تنفروا ولا تقتلوا وريدا 
وإذا لقيت عدو عدوكم من المشركين فادعوهم إلى ثلاث خصال أو خلال فأيتهن فأيتهن ما أجاب أجابك فاقبل منهم وكف عنهم ثم ادعوهم إلى إلى الإسلام فإن أجابوك فاقبل منهم ثم ادعوهم إلى إلى التحول من دار دارهم إلى دار المهاجرين وأخبرهم أنهم إن فعلوا ذلك فلهم ما فلهم ما للمهاجرين وعليهم وأم وعليهم ما على المهاجرين فإن أبوا أن يتحولوا منها فأخبرهم أنهم يكونون كعراب المسلمين يجري يجري عليهم حكم الله تعالى الذي يجري على المؤمنين ولا يكون لهم في القميمة في القميمة في القليمة والفيء شيء إلا أن يجاهدون أن يجاهدون مع مع المسلمين فإنهم أبوا فاسألهم فاسأل فاسألهم الجزية فإنهم أجابوك فاقبل منهم فاقبل منهم وكف عنهم فإنهم أبوا فاستعين بالله وقاتلهم وإذا حارست وإذا حارست على أهل أحل حسن فأرا فأرادوك أن تجعل لهم ذمة الله وذمة نبيه ولا تجعل لهم ذمة الله ولا ذمة نبيه ولكن اجعل لهم ذمتك وذمة أصحابك فإنك أن تقول أن تخفر أن تخفر أن تخفر ذممكم وذمم أصحابكم أهو أهون من أن أن تخفر ذمة الله وذمة الرسول كل ذمة نبيه فإذا حارست أهل حسن فأرا فأرادوك أن أن تنزلهم على حكم الله فلا تنزلهم على حكم الله ولكن أنزلهم على حكمك فإنك لا تدري أتصيب حكم الله في فيهم أم لا رواه مسلم نعم so chapter 63 مقصود so the objective of this ترجمة is to clarify for you that, uh, or to clarify the hukum and the ruling um, on uh, making a, uh, a promise through, through the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal and the protection of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam making a promise on the protection of Allah <coughs> and the protection <coughs> of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so بَعْبْ مَا جَاءَ فِي ذِمَّةِ اللَّهِ وَذِمَّةِ النَّبِيهِ Sallallahu means the protection of Allah or the covenant of Allah and the covenant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he cites an evidence uh, two evidences so he cites two evidences وَأَوْفُوا بِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ إِذَا عَاهَدْتُمْ وَلَا تَنْقُضُوا الْأَيْمَانَ بَعْدَ تَوْكِيدِهَا Allah says fulfill يعني Allah's ahd and his pledge in Islam and وَلَا تَنْقُضُوا الْأَيْمَانَ يعني do not break the covenant بعد توكيدها after affirming it after affirming affirming it do not break the promise so if a person promises for someone under the protection under the ahd of Allah under the dhimmatullah under the protection of Allah or the covenant of Allah it is as though this person is is speaking on behalf of Allah azza wa jal or if a person takes an oath Sorry, not an old sorry, or covenant under the protection of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's as though they're speaking on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the ver- the first delil here, the wajhu dilala, is that the Allah says wa'ufu bi ahdillah. Yani wa'ufu bi ahdillah. So the amr here is is lil wujub, is obligation. So uh, Allah, yani fulfill Allah's ahd, His covenant, His pledge. So fulfill Allah's pledge. So that means it's wajib to fulfill. Allah's ahd, His promise, um, and the greatest promise is uh, is basically making a promise and making a covenant that they give to someone up under the protection of Allah and the protection of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yani that is the greatest uh, dhimma that a person can do. So that's the first dalil. The second dalil is the hadith of Buraida. And the dilala is at the end of this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he forbade and he prohibited the Sahaba when giving protection to an enemy, that they give them a protection under the protection of Allah. They say you are protected under Allah Azza wa under the protection of Allah and the protection of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the protection of Allah Azza wa is so great 
uh, and that it's uh, it, it, it's as the Prophet says فَإِنَّكُمْ إِنْ تُخْفِرُوا ذِمَّمَكُمْ وَذِمَّةَ أَصْحَابِكُمْ يعني it is less serious to break your promise uh, it is less serious to break your promise of protection of Allah and His Prophet so instead of the Prophet saying instead of making a promise that they will be protected under, under the protection of Allah or under the protection of the Prophet ﷺ, then make a promise that they will be protected under your protection because if then something happens and they are not protected then it's less serious then matter it's less serious and the, the, its connection to Tawheed is out of respect for Allah Azza wa Jal and it is uh, to out of respect for Allah Azza wa Jal فمن يرج أو ينزل بميت فإنما رجائي بحي لا يموت ومنزلي فيا راجيا غوث الرفاعي دهره متى جاء غوث من تراب وجندلي